What are your views on money as a spiritual guy? I believe money is a neutral concept that has no built-in meaning other than the meaning we give it. So everything in life is a reflection of what we believe to be true. If I believe money is bad, I'm not gonna attract it. So what do you believe happens when we die? We're of a certain level of consciousness to where we go to what it could be called an astral planet, an astral plane of existence. I don't know if I'm overstepping the boundaries here. No, there's no overstepping. I think that heaven could be. I actually agree with what you're saying. People would find that weird. The reason I agree is because What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I got a treat for you. This guy was selling women's shoes and decided one day he wanted to become a YouTuber. And six months later, he had 100,000 subs. And today, he has over 1.6 million subs. And he's one of the leading authorities on just mindset, spirituality, you know, just these different ideas of money. And I'm really excited to talk to him because as a Christian and, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of Christians about money and they have a negative connotation and he's got a whole different perspective on money that he's dealing with different things. And so I think we're going to get into a lot of great conversation. I've got Aaron Dowdy. What's up, man? Awesome. Thanks for having me on, bro. Yeah. Excited to be here. Yeah. So first off, dude, women's shoes to YouTuber to, yeah. you know, being known for spirituality and all this. How'd that happen? Uh, I mean, back in... 2012, I went through a spiritual awakening where uh, my life completely changed when I basically was learning how to meditate. Um, at that time in 2012, I was working a nine to five job I wasn't passionate about. I was taking uh, something called Adderall, which I'm sure you've, you've yeah. heard of, where I was on Adderall and I was taking that just to focus during the day. I was labeled as having ADHD. And what happened was, is I was basically stuck where I was on this hamster wheel where I was taking Adderall during the day to focus and I was smoking cannabis at night just to balance out the effects of, of, the, these, Adderall. of the Adderall, which you can't <laughs> eat or sleep. And then you, at the end of the night, I'm like, I need to be able to eat or sleep. And then I would do that. And after a while, I was like, man, this just seems like not healthy. This seems like I'm dependent on this stuff. And in 2012, I, I decided to went online and looked up like alternatives and came across meditation. And it was something that at first I was like meditation, you know, I had all these connotations around it, but I thought it was so kind of desperate to like not be codependent onto these, these things that I decided to learn meditation. And the first time I did it, I didn't have much of an experience doing it. I felt like I was trying to control my thoughts. Um, I felt like resistance in my body. And then second or third time I, I read somewhere online cause I was doing a lot of research on it, that if you stare at a candle flame, with your eyes focused on one spot, it made it a lot easier to meditate. And then if you simply observe your thoughts, that your, your, your mind begins to slow down versus trying to control your thoughts. Mm. And that for me, being able to observe my thoughts without trying to control them, there was like this spaciousness that started to come, like just started to like expand inside of myself. I started to feel completely different. And within this, the, literally the third time meditating and having that experience, I started to feel completely different. I started to have this, like, I had this experience where I started to like really question things about my reality, question my past and like some of the things with my childhood even. And I went through this total transform, tra transformational process that completely changed me from the inside out. Within two or three weeks, completely stopped taking Adderall. Within two or three weeks, completely stopped smoking cannabis. I started meditating and my whole entire energy changed. So what happened was, now to be completely honest with you, I had that spiritual awakening and then I became kind of ungrounded for a while. I was, it's a very common thing that happens in like the spiritual awakening, like kind of like the niche that I'm in where people go through that and then they're like meditating with crystals and like doing all this kind of like woo woo things, you know? Um, and for a while I was kind of ungrounded, but then eventually like a year later, I got more grounded and um, I was working at Nordstrom's and Women's Shoes in 2012, which is what I'm talking about. Um, and then in 2013, I uh, basically was working at Barney's New York. I got went to, to that place also selling women's shoes. And for five years, I worked there. I knew I wasn't passionate about it. I was super excited about learning about reality. How does reality work? Studying different type of texts, whether it's like ancient mystical spiritual texts or whether it's uh, even like personal development, like Tony Robbins or something like that. And I was just so fascinated with learning as much as I could about personal transformation, um, kind of like personal development, spirituality. And basically in 2017, when I was working at Barney's New York and Women's Shoes, I recognized and became aware 
of my identity. I became aware of who I was being because I, I, I was learning that how you think, feel, and act creates a reality. And I was honest with myself, how am I thinking, feeling, and acting? And I realized I was thinking, feeling, and acting equal to a nine to five job goer. Even though I didn't like that job, mm. uh, here I am selling woman's shoes and things weren't fair at the job I had. Like I had corporate politics that I was dealing with where like you had to suck up to managers to get the schedule you wanted. Yeah. It was all this like, this BS that we that I had to deal with. But I realized that I would go to work. We'd all complain. All the salespeople would complain about how slow it was. You know, I was thinking, feeling, and acting equal to that version of myself. So then what I did is in 2017, um, I was basically, I read a book called Crush It by Gary Vaynerchuk, which yep. I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. And basically I just realized that the missing key for me, because I was thinking about what I wanted when it comes to like learning about manifestation and all of these things, but thinking never really got the job done for me. Just thinking about it, even feeling it for me, the game changer was when I realized that I had to be it. So in 2017, in February, I was actually living at my dad's house. I moved back in with my dad's because I wanted to figure out the YouTube thing while I'm working 40 hours a week selling women's shoes. And I had this, I like after meditation one day, I had this idea, this insight that said, if you make a video a day, your life will change in a year from now. Like within a year, your whole life will change if you make a video a day. So what I did is I committed to a video every single day, no matter what. Even though I worked at Barney's New York and sometimes would work until like 11 o'clock at night or 12 at night, if I got home at 12 at night, I would film a video, uh, edit the video, schedule the video to go out the next day, make the thumbnail for the video, go to bed and then do it all over again mm -hmm. because I committed to that daily video as that new version of me, that new identity. So um, within... Yeah, within three to six months, I had 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, my last day of having that nine to five job was the Conor McGregor Mayweather fight. I don't know if you remember that. Yep, yep. Yeah, that was, uh, I wanted to work that day because I we lived, you know, I lived in Vegas and uh, knew it was going to be a very busy day and it was commissioned job. So I worked commissioned job pretty much my whole entire, my whole entire life until I owned my own business. Which is still commission. Which is still, which is still commission. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so that was the shift for me of then making daily videos in 2017 is when I started to be that YouTuber and I would just share what I was learning. I wasn't some guru on the top of the hill that was like, I'm spiritually enlightened. Let me show you how to do what I do. <laughs> you know that crack up was, uh, what's that guy, JP? He's so yeah, funny. He's got, he's got riffs on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's funny. I like that guy. Um, no, but dude, I think what, what you said is super cool about just having the intention Mm -hmm. Of like, look, dude, I'm gonna change my identity. And the only way I'm gonna change my identity is by changing my actions. Yeah. And so I'm gonna commit to one thing. It's yep. very simple to say yes or no. Did yeah. I do this? And if I want to be a YouTuber, I need to actually make a YouTube video right. every day. Yeah. I'm not gonna just say, yeah, I'm gonna be a YouTuber and then I do nothing. Yeah. Because that's what I see people do. I'm gonna invest in real estate. I'm gonna start a podcast. Yep. It's like, no, bro, like do it every day. Right. Or if maybe it's not every day, but hey, I'm going to release one video a week. What, what yep. every other, whatever the case is, right? Right. That's what I did when I got on TikTok back in 2020. I was like, I'm going to post one TikTok every day. Yep. I'm going to just wake up 30 minutes earlier. I'm going to film it. I don't know what I'm doing. Yep. But I'm going to just do it. Yeah. And that was it. And the more reps you put in, the better you get. Yeah. You know, but one, you got to commit. You do have to commit. That was the, that was the time everything changed in my life was when I committed. Now I will say one thing about the identity that was holding me back for a while is we have this, th we have this thing where we say, this is, this isn't who I am. This, this YouTuber is fake. This isn't who I am. What I realized though, was how much I hated my nine to five job, how I had to deal with the corporate politics, which by the way, the story that I had, which is life's, you know, life's not fair. It's not fair what's happening. was very similar to my childhood when things weren't fair. There was a familiarity that was keeping me stuck in that nine to five job, I believe. And what I realized though, was that that version of me that was in that nine to five job that was complaining about it, that was more a fake version of me than the YouTuber version of me, even though the YouTuber version of me was this new version of me I hadn't been yet. Mm. I realized that I was playing small. I realized that I was kind of, it was fake for me to go into a job where I don't like it. I'm not even passionate about it. Um, it was like, I, I then started to, see the old identity that I was being as more fake than the new identity of me being a YouTuber. That really- That you were becoming. That I was becoming. I was like, well, me, even though it, anything you do with more repetitions, you get better at. So at first it was weird. I'm looking into a camera. I'm like, 
looking at myself and I'm, <laughs> I'm making eye contact. I'm like, that's not a person. I'm like, but then what happened is I did it and then I did it and then I did it, I did it. And then it got, and then it became normal and familiar, yeah. right? So I'm sure for you on TikTok, you made a video. It's like, this is weird. This is what all the young kids dancing. do. <laughs> you, were really, you were really doing dancing? I did a couple of dances, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I, I'm doing that, it. That did, I'm doing that it. That did feel fake. <laughs> <laughs> do you still do those dances? You know, I might have to bring them back. You never know. <laughs> right? <laughs> but you but you probably, the first time you did that dance, right? Or whatever. Yeah. It was yeah. probably weird, weird as oh, hell. It's still weird, yeah. And then you did. <laughs> you were just able to rationalize it back then. Back then, I'm like, this is what everyone does. Yeah, this, this is what it takes. This is TikTok, you know? <laughs> Let's pause real quick. We just launched something new that I'm really excited about, which is our text hotline. It is now easier than ever to get in touch with myself and my team. If you've ever been thinking about working with us in any way, whether it's through real estate investing, learning how to create content or scaling your business, we want to help you out. And it's super simple. All you got to do is just text 725-444-5244. If you text that number, my team is gonna get in touch with you right away. And I, in fact, might be responding to some of those texts as we get the system just built out and rolling. We can answer any of your questions for getting you help, telling you about our different programs, different events we've got coming up, different resources that we have that can help you. It's gonna be epic. So just text us at 725-444-5244 and somebody will respond to you and get you help right now. So, um, but yeah, you anything you do, more repetitious becomes more familiar. Yeah. So it's funny to remember that because all that like probably mean you have done in many ways is we put more reps into certain things that other people can look at and be like, wow, they accomplished all these things. We just put in the reps. Yeah. And the more reps you put in, the better you get. But there's an identity that has certain reps that are that are that are consistent to that. And for me, back in the day, YouTube, daily videos wired in that identity very powerfully. And then that became, and, and funny enough now, now I'm in a stage where I've been a YouTuber for seven years and I've realized that I've kind of created my own box within this. Mm. So I was in a box in that nine to five job and I didn't like it and I broke out of the box. I became a YouTuber. Yeah. And then funny enough, I'm putting all this pressure on myself daily video on YouTube. I made daily videos on YouTube for three or four years. Mm. And I, I remember one time I was in Costa Rica. I was at a retreat. I was going through this powerful transformative process and I still had to make videos. I couldn't let myself take one day off from making videos. Wow. And I didn't really batch content. So I'm like, I'm like going through a process, like making videos. And my breakthrough one time was just to freaking stop making, like don't make a video one day. Yeah. You know, you're past that point now. Yes. And, and now I don't make daily videos anymore, but now I'm, I'm doing more live in person events. I'm really passionate about that. But there's, there's almost a fear that comes from the box of making YouTube videos. Not to say that I can't make YouTube videos anymore because I will, but I do it in a different way now because I've recreated that nine to five job. Instead of having a boss tell me what to do, I become my own boss that almost is putting such a high standard on myself that it's like I wasn't enjoying life as much. I wasn't like, um, I wasn't as passionate having as much fun with it as I used to have. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been a constant, part, it's been a, a constant journey of breaking out of the box and sometimes realizing that I create my own box and then now getting into this new identity of doing more live in-person events, of traveling, of of kind of like doing what I'm doing now. Um, it's been a whole other identity shifting process. Yeah. No, and it's tough, man, because people don't ever want to give up what's familiar, yeah. right? Like when you look at Let's just say, I mean, dude, you sold women's shoes for a long time. It yeah. wasn't easy to give it up, even though you may not have liked it. It's still familiar. You're yeah. like, dude, this is this is how I live. Right. You know, it's hard. It's to, predictable. Yeah. Predict. People would rather have predictable mediocrity. Yeah. Than take the risk at being great. Right. That's the majority of people. Yeah. And even for you, right? Like, so you finally take a risk. It pays off. Now you have this new identity. And then you're like, man, dude. If I stop doing this, what happens? You know, this yeah. is very safe and predictable. Like, am I going to have to go back to selling shoes if I'm not posting right. every day? Like, what's going to happen? It's funny. There's there's times I have. So I'm, I'm a big uh, Carl Jung fan. Carl Jung, a psychologist from back in like the early 1900s. But okay. he talks a lot about the subconscious. And basically, I'm a, a big fan of studying dr my dreams. So using and learning called, called shadow work, but like looking at your dreams, which are said to be symbolic representations of like the different energies we're integrating in our life. Um, but basically I have dreams sometimes where I'm still in that nine to five job 
and I am in that nine to five job and I'm going in the back to grab someone's shoes and I have this experience where I, I'm like, wait, I'm a YouTuber with millions of followers, all this abundance, and here I am in this nine to five job. Like I can leave, like why am I still here? And that, a version of that dream I have every couple months. Yeah, and fear. it's a, and to me, it's a way of like kind of connecting to this part that we're talking about, this familiar, like this this recreation of that familiar energy, and recognizing it and realizing that I could break out of the box or or like not still be in that familiar energy because I put a lot of pressure on myself, you know, yeah. which I think we all do, especially people that like really passionate about what they do. But it's it's important to like yeah. you know kind of shift out of that. No, I'm with you. You you essentially have to keep. I guess shedding your old skin yeah. to, to reach the new level of whatever you're trying to do, right? Yep. You know, the way that I ran my business five years ago is likely not going to work today. Right. And on top of that, it's definitely not going to work if I want to like reach a new level. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it, it's just so many people fail to adapt and pivot and do what they yeah. do. So for me, you know, I've had a lot of different guys on the show, business guys, pastors, mm -hmm. family people, neuro experts. And I've had a few, like, I, I guess I would just call them spirituality guys. Right? Yeah. And I always ask them like, okay, as a Christian, what, you know, what is spirituality? It's such a vague yeah. term for us. It means one thing. But yep. then if I ask Tony Robbins, like you mentioned, or I ask some other guy, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's energy. It's right. Vibrations. And I'm like, all right, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to, I want to get it straight on, on what it is. Are we talking about the same thing? Like what, what are we talking about? I think in, in many ways, there are a lot of correlations and like parallels with the, what we're both talking about. They're just expressed with maybe different terminology. Okay. I think spirituality is whatever a person feels in alignment with to connect to the divine. Okay. So for some people that might be a very specific modality or very specific, um, like, like thought, like process that they're connected to or, or some tradition even. And for some other people, I've met very spiritual people that don't really have any late. They don't even, they don't even identify with the word spiritual, but they live in a constant flow and they feel connected to everything. So I think it really depends on the person. Um, I think that a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of people in my audience that are Christian or religious in some way, but still they're into the spiritual kind of like, uh, like more manifestation or create your own reality type content. So I think that in many ways, these things aren't mutually exclusive where they're, they're like separate things. I think it just kind of depends on the individual's personal like connection to what the divine is. And I think there's different interpretations of that. Um, I was talking to someone earlier here at your office about this because she she wanted us to talk about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I was like, okay, I'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about this. I find it interesting. Um, have you ever heard of Paramahansa Yogananda? No. Paramahansa Yogananda. I can't uh, even say that. What is it's, that. It's hard to say. Yeah, he's a, he was an, an, what is considered to be an enlightened master that came from India to the West back in the 19, early 1900s. And he started what is called the Self-Realization Centers in California. There's one in Encinitas. There's one in LA. He died a long time ago. Um, he's where like the Beatles and like uh, Steve Jobs, like went to India, had like their experience, then came back. Autobiography of a Yogi is the one book that was in that Steve Jobs read every year, like the last 40 years of his life at his funeral. It was the only book in the iPads that were given away at his funeral. Um, Autobiography of a Yogi is one of the most powerful books I've ever read, which is basically this enlightened master's perspective of life, his autobiography of the things he experienced in India, and then bringing the, bringing the, um, the Eastern information to the West. And he brought it in the form of yoga. He's known for being bringing yoga to the West, but also the way that he did it was he connected using the teachings of Jesus of talking about a perspective. He, he was, he loved Jesus. He had this connection with Jesus where he would talk about Jesus. And that was his way of connecting with the people in the United States was by connecting these two ideologies together. Now, a lot of it is understanding and if you were to talk to maybe certain perspectives in the spiritual community in general, if you were like, we were dialoguing about this, it could be um, that Jesus embodied the I am presence, the God energy of, 
of who he was at such a profound level that it inspired so many other people to tap into that same I am energy, mm -hmm. to embody that energy. So in a way, he was an example for a way of expressing himself, a way of being in the world that could inspire people to also be like him. And what Paramahansa Yogananda did is he would use these teachings to kind of teach a certain level, a certain perspective of Jesus through the books. He, he actually has books on where like they're specifically about Jesus even. Mm -hmm. But from that perspective as well, it's almost like Jesus is a like a higher, higher elevated conscious being who was probably, in, you know, is enlightened. And uh, we just have all these connotations with what enlightenment is in, the, in India. You know, we have all these like kind of, we, we separate all these things when in essence, I think a lot of times they're talking about very similar things. We're all love. We're all connected. We're all one consciousness. Treat people the way you want to be treated because the other person that you're treating a specific way is you at the deepest levels. We're all one. So it's an interesting, I mean, there's many different probably layers we could go within that. But yeah, yeah I think I think it's, uh, I don't see it as like a separate thing. I think uh, Jesus is the way is a way of saying like the way Jesus was is the way. The way Jesus is, is the way. The way he is being is something that we can emulate and be more like him. And by being more like him, by being more loving, by being more um, from that energy, I think that we elevate everyone around us. Yeah. So it's almost like he, from a certain perspective of the spiritual side is also like a symbol of the energy that we all carry within ourselves if we're all one consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes, sometimes if I'm being honest, when I see the different perspectives, like I see um, if we are going to separate them, when you talk about religion, we talk about spirituality. I think it's sometimes like where the disagreement is, is where Jesus is the way as in like as an entity, whereas like Jesus is also something that we're all connected to. I'd be curious to your perspective on this. Yeah, I'm just kind yeah, of no. talking out loud here, you know? Wealth Builders, I'm so excited to announce the launch of Wealthy University. This is literally the best deal we've ever created. Imagine if you got calls with me and my team every single week where you can ask Q&A and get up-to-date information on what's working in my business and for other experts in the world. On top of that, what if you got access to all of our courses? And what if you got access to exclusive softwares like our CRMs in our community to go and do deals and make relationships? Well, if that sounds like something you wanna be a part of, it's only $97 a month. I'm not kidding you. If you've joined any of our other programs, you know they're a lot more expensive than that. So to get access to our community for only $97 a month is absolutely insane, and it's so easy to sign up. All you gotta do is go to wealthyuniversity.com and you could sign up today and get instant access to those calls, exclusive content like our WealthCon recordings or our workshop recordings, and so many other things in the community. So go check out Wealthy University today and get signed up. For me anyways, I like having um, people who have different viewpoints on the podcast. Cool. And it's funny because um, I've gotten criticism from Christians or other people who are like, well, dude, like, you know, that's spreading something that's not um, what we believe biblically true. And I'll be like, well, how else are you going to talk out different ideas right. and everything else? Like, yeah. you know, if I can't um, defend what I believe objectively, then yes. I probably need to relook at what it is I believe. Right, right yeah. And on top of that, we just kind of live in a world of clips where, you know, right. they'll take a clip of what you just said. And they're like, well, dude, Ryan just, he denounced Jesus. I'm like, no, I didn't. Like, what are you talking about? So um, that's the hard part about running a podcast. But nonetheless, the disclaimer's in there. So here's kind of like what I think about it. I think there's lots of religions or spiritualities that um, I think everyone agrees Jesus was amazing. Yes. Right? Like everyone's like, bro. You talk to, um, you know, you, you talk to Muslims, you talk to Mormons, you talk to Christians, you talk to pretty much any religion. They would be like, yeah, no, Jesus, dude, the way that guy lived, amazing. I think what comes down to the difference is, um, do you end up believing everything he said? That's yeah. where I think the difference comes into play because I think a lot of religions or spiritual people will pick and choose to be like, well, I love the aspect that Jesus served. I love that he, he loved people. He, yeah. loved, you know, all these, but then you still have to rectify. Well, Jesus did say he's the only way. So how but do see you the interpretation of that though? Mm -hmm. One's more, see, I think back in the day, this is my perspective. I'm not really attached to like getting mm -hmm. anyone to think the way that I think or anything, but yeah. I think back in the day they spoke in very symbolic metaphoric forms of way of conveying information. So if it was like, 
using a metaphor in the Bible or something like that. Um, but when he says, Jesus says, I am the way, it seemed to me that Jesus had, it was very almost like transcended his ego. You know what I mean? Like he, mm -hmm. he's like this enlightened guy that transcended his ego mm -hmm. and he's coming from this higher level of consciousness, but then he's like, I am the way, I am the way you were, you know, like you worship me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. from my perspective, I would say that maybe the interpretation of that is like, I am is the way, like I am, like I am the way, the way that I am being because obviously he was being so different than everyone else. Everyone else that was around him was of such a different level of consciousness that yeah. they couldn't understand what he did or what he was what he was saying even, so they killed him. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah. what happens when you're in fear, when you don't understand something that is challenging your current belief system mm -hmm. and they, they killed him. Yeah. But when he's saying, I am the way, I think it could have been, I am the way, like the way I am being, like the level of consciousness that I carry. And a lot of times I think he said, the things that I do, you can do, and even more so. Yeah. I think he said things like that too. So it's like, I think that's really cool. But I think- Well, I think though, and you know, it's not to like, um, I don't want anyone listening or even you to like feel like, oh, I'm just trying to convert this guy or anything. Yeah. I, I think that the main thing is, okay, even if you take that interpretation, there's still 10 other things he said that wouldn't really line up with that. Okay. You know, if he's saying, well, hey, the father and I are one. We have been together. You know, John 1, 1 is, you know, the word was with God since the beginning. Yeah. Right. It's like, well, how do you rectify that? I mean, he's saying he's been around since the beginning. It was him and God. And you start to look at all of these other things. And then with him saying, I am the way, right? There are no other ways, right? It's like, all right, well, you know, live like me. That That is one interpretation. But I think it also then just goes back to, okay, you're saying live like him, but what's the point of living like him, right? Like what, yeah. okay, I, I make the decision to do this. Mm -hmm. What's the end result? Why should I choose to live like him, right? And you're like, well, um, you're gonna have a better life. You're gonna be happier. Yeah. You'll have more peace and all this. But in reality, he talked about, hey, I mean, there's this thing called heaven, right? Right. And I'm the only way to get there. Yeah. And that's very different than any other religion where, you know, they're like, there's lots of religions. They're like, there's lots of ways, right? They're all leading to the same thing. You know, yeah, that that's I think they call that universalism. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. OK, I don't know if I'm overstepping the boundaries. Here. No, there's no I'm overstepping. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm just curious. So do you think or do you believe that heaven is a, is a place? I'm, I'm really curious. Like, do I think it's a place? Like, like, so when you die, do you go to heaven and then you're there forever? I'm yeah, just curious. There, there is an eternal place. Yes. OK. Called heaven. What if, so from my perspective, I think that heaven could be a level of consciousness where we can create heaven here, like I agree in the with that present too. moment. So, so I agree that the kingdom, as Jesus would call it, is also here yes. right now. Yes. I agree with that. I agree with that. So yeah. So yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think in many ways, the him, him and God are one. And here, let me, let me preface this by saying I'm not, I have not studied the, the Bible. Yeah, I'm the, not. Yeah. I'm not some expert at this. Yeah, I'm yeah, just. Yeah. I'm just sharing it from like my perspective. From what you've heard, what you've seen. From what I've heard, yeah, yeah. I grew up going to church. Yeah. You know, I grew up going to church. I, I every Sunday, and you know. Yeah. Um. So, but I'm not like studied in it. Like this isn't what I do for a living no, necessarily. I know, I know. Um. That's why I'm bringing up like I'm just, the counterpoints. I'm just and exactly, and I'm just like kind of picking different ideas it. around just to kind of make it. You know, just to kind of no, like show different I, perspectives. I, I do agree with you that. The kingdom is here on earth. So, yes. And this is part of, you know, what you just mentioned earlier of like, Jesus is like, you can do the same things I do. He did say that, but he said, once you have my spirit. And once, once you are at that level, see, I think the thing is, is I see it more as like a level of consciousness. He mm -hmm. represents the, I am God, Christ consciousness, which he said, I have, you have as well. And I am God are one is like, I am this consciousness and God are one which means that also we can connect to that energy within ourselves and also be one. So in a way, it's kind of like, they're just different terms, I guess, or it's almost a different a different way of looking at it, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's all, I guess, open to interpretation as well because there's so many different people that have different perspectives. And I'm sure even within Christianity, right? There's people who say, this yeah, is the yeah. way. There's a, reason, there's a reason there's lots of denominations. Yep. There's a, you know, there's a reason that there's different things like Mormons and Catholics yep. and they, they all believe different things. Yeah. Um, I would say really the question, because in terms of spirituality, yes, we both agree. Yeah. There is this spiritual element to the world. Yeah. Right. Do you believe in demons? Um, 
I believe that de- I have a in- interesting perspective on okay. demons. I think that we're all one consciousness, and I think that demons are a manifestation of certain thought processes, certain Do you think energies. they're like just negative thoughts and negative energy? Mm, I think in a way, I mean, we're getting into some esoteric stuff here. <laughs> um, I think that they can exist. Okay. These idea of these negative entities and things, but I think people give a lot of power over to them because they're fearful of them. And they're- I agree. And maybe that maybe like, you know, when people drink alcohol and things like that, maybe uh, there's, there's perspectives that like, they're yeah. around certain energies that like cling to them and stuff like that. But ultimately I think we have the power to in a way elevate our own vibration, our frequency, whatever label we want to get it, connect mm-hmm. to our hearts and stuff. But I don't think they have as much power over us as like a lot of people give it. But I think that maybe I think I think that we live in a very vast universe. And I think that there's a big spectrum of emotion, feeling, and entities. And if there's angels and divine beings or like different levels of consciousness, even extraterrestrial consciousnesses, maybe, yeah. there's also probably lower vibrational versions of that like you know like like entities and and things like that so i think they they could exist you know yeah i think um well obviously the bible says there's angels and there's demons right yeah and if you're gonna believe in the spiritual realm in my opinion and and you're believing in the divine let's call god right it does make sense that there are things in the spiritual realm we can't see yep right obviously we see ourselves and i don't you know i I think you talk to spiritual guys like well we are energy right so like we're just these masses of energy, yes. you know, here on earth. And yeah. then there's things we cannot perceive or see right yeah. now until maybe in your, in your words, you achieve a new level of consciousness where now you become aware yes. of what these things are happening. Right. And I do believe even in the Christian faith that happens. I think that when you're yeah. dwelled with the Holy spirit, you become aware of spiritual things yeah. that you were not aware of before. I mean, the Bible talks about like this veil Oh, is for removed sure. from your eyes. I agree with and that. It's like, wow. Yep. Life isn't the way I thought it was. Right. Um, but I would say the other thing that makes Jesus a little bit different, not a little bit, a lot, is if you look at all the other religions, none of them claim to be God, right? Like Muhammad didn't say, you know, I'm God. Yeah. You know, Joseph Smith did not say, hey, like, I'm God. Um, Buddha yeah. did not say, I'm God. He said, I'm enlightened. Like yep. I, I've reached a new level of consciousness, but he didn't claim I'm God. You should worship me. Right. Jesus was the only one who did that. And so that does make him a lot different to look at mm. as a spiritual person. Cause you're like, wait a minute. These guys are kind of saying what Aaron's saying in that, Hey, we can reach enlightenment. We can become yeah. like God. Joseph Smith said that, you know, yeah. Joseph Smith thinks in the Mormon religion, they believe God was a man on another planet who achieved mm. Godhood because of essentially his enlightenment. Yeah. And now he's the God of this planet. That's what Mormons believe. It's very different than the Bible. Yeah, it is very different. Yeah. I don't know why they say they're Christians, but nonetheless, forget yeah. that. But like, that's when I hear you say that, I'm like, okay, that, that aligns with what you're saying too. Right. But when you're talking about Jesus, he didn't say any of that. Jesus, like as a guy is great to emulate his actions as a leader, yeah. as a servant, as love, as peace. Everyone can agree to that. But you still have to answer the question of why did this guy say he's God? No one else did that. But who, but who, but see the, 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 the different, or I guess the perspective that I'm kind of like poking at here is that when he says, I am the way, or I am God, it's the, I am presence inside of himself. So it's like, but still nobody spoke like that. No. Yeah, well, he was he's maybe of a higher level of consciousness. <laughs> he's at <laughs> being God. Yeah, right? like well, but still, but like God, you have what, to what look is at God? Diff- what yeah. is God? Yeah, you know that 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 ins- it kind of like inspires that question. Like, what is God? Is God an energy? Is it mm. a vast divine presence? Is it this moment? Like, is God a person? Like, yeah, you talked about that with divine. I actually am here because you're like, man, yeah, like, and then divine's this whole thing. Like, what what do yeah. you think that means? The divine? Yeah. Mm, I believe, I mean, I, I believe that God, the divine source energy, whatever we want to call it, I think that it already exists inside of us. Mm. And the ego that we have is what separates us from that because the ego wants to be right. The ego wants to do things in its own interest. Mm-hmm. The ego is maybe attached to lower vibrational emotions like yeah. fear, guilt, anger, you know. Um, but when you when you connect more to that divine energy that exists inside of you, yeah. You elevate, you elevate how you feel, 
and you see things as more connected. You see other people as more of an extension of you. So I think the divine to me is the energy that's inside of me that's also inside of everyone else. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking about demons earlier, from the perspective that I have, it's like, it's almost like darkness is the absence of light. Yes. Demons in many ways could be just the absence of that loving, unconditional love energy that it naturally is. But if everything's a reflection, like if everything, if we imagine we came to earth to like experience the many different nuances of experience, of using the five senses, of mm -hmm. learning things. What if earth is kind of like a school where we, we learn different things, you know? Yeah. I think, I think the, the lesson we came here to learn was unconditional love. It was through presence, unconditional love, maybe elevating our level of consciousness. And the more we recognize the divine, the more that energy flows through. When I make YouTube videos, and I'm not saying I'm I'm not enlightened, I'm not saying I'm enlightened or <laughs> anything like that. You're but not, when I make you're not YouTube, JP, I'm not. No, I am. <laughs> instead, I am somebody though that like when I make YouTube videos, the only reason I've been able to make daily videos on YouTube for three or four years is because. I don't, it, like Aaron Dowdy d isn't like, I'm not doing it from that level, like that energy of like, I'm doing this so that I am, a, you know, I look a certain way or it's more of, I allow, I would kind of like get out of the way and allow energy to come through yeah, so that I could express whatever needs to be expressed. Because I believe the more value you add to other people, the more energy comes back to you. But also those other people are other aspects of you. So by in a way, just trusting the divine to flow through, it comes through in a way to where I, I don't, ever script out videos. Mm -hmm. I've never, like the only thing I've done is the night before my videos, like I, I'd have like a title of something I want to talk about. But other than that, the whole idea comes once I get on camera. Yeah. And it's very little of, I'd, like I'm sure my ego, my ego uses stories to describe things. And yeah. like, I'm not saying my ego isn't used at all. And I'm some enlightened person when I make videos. I'm just saying that I believe when we allow the divine to flow through us and we trust in something greater than ourselves, a different level of energy comes through that allows us to add value. Because in our reality, what I believe is that we are all connected and that when you have the intention of adding value to more people, the universe, God, the un whatever label we want to give it, gives us more synchronicity, it gives us more opportunities, it gives us more resources to use that gift because we're coming at it from this divine place of wanting to add value. Mm. So I think in some ways the divine to me is the connection that we all have to each other, but off to this, like to, to love. I guess, I guess if I were to summarize it, to me, the divine is love. Mm. The divine is God, is, is love, is God, whatever label we want to give it, but it's love. It's the frequency of the love that you feel with other people and the ego separates itself from other people. That's where yeah. we get caught up. But if you remove the ego and you see everyone as love, even those demons, even the, like what are they're just lost, lost souls, yep. you know, it's uh, Your enemies. like, I don't mean you, that you have to like engage with it and like, like get caught up in it. I'm yeah. just mean you, if you have a different perspective, like if we are, that means everything, everyone is divine to a certain level. Even the people doing crazy shit out in the world. Yeah. What if they're just lost and they're, they've went through crazy trauma growing up and they're doing the best they can with the level of consciousness they're at. But that I, a level by the way, I agree with that. If you haven't heard, WealthCon is coming back to Las Vegas April 18th to the 20th, and I believe it's going to be our biggest one yet. We're going to try and fill the Caesars Palace with 2,000 top-level real estate investors and entrepreneurs. I've got amazing speakers like Neil Patel, Tim Grover, Dan Martell, Pace Morby, and many others coming, and it's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets today, we got some special deals going on. All you got to do is text me at 725 444 522 Four, four. We'll get you info on what kind of tickets we got all the way from general admission to our diamond level tickets where you're able to network with the speakers, go backstage, ask them questions, and then have a dinner with all of us in a really intimate setting. It's going to be great. So if you want to get tickets, text me at 725-444-5244. Would you, would you describe the divine as, as love or as, I'm, I'm curious as to kind of your perspective. Well, it's funny because Jesus already described it you know he actually somebody goes you know one of these pharisees who killed him they're yeah. like okay so summarize basically what what is the law yeah and jesus is like love god number one love others number two that's nice. it that's yeah. the easiest way to follow the law if you love god and you love others you're following the law right and it's like you if you really just like looked at life in that order you'd be like all right yeah i yeah. get it now and that, that goes back to the part of, okay, but he's saying love God. So 
you know, we all can agree with love others. Yeah. So, but you still have to rectify this. And he's saying that goes first. And like, I guess for me, we were talking about um, high school debates because you were on yes. the debate team. Yes. And ironically, you you went to school out here in Vegas. Yep. Same year. We both graduated 07. Isn't that crazy? Super crazy. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, man. Yeah. That might be the first time I've had that happen, you know, on this podcast. Yeah, in Vegas right? and same both year. graduated same year. Yeah. And I was just like, so what did you do? Did you play sports out there? Maybe we played against each other. You're like, no, I did debate. And you were yep. telling me about um, how you guys would have to research a subject, you know, for and yeah. against, yep. right? To get a true objectional view of it. Yeah. And that's something I've been doing a lot of with faith and spirituality. And that's why, like, I'm excited to have you on because I'm truly yeah. like... Yes, I have. We all have our preconceived biases of what we believe. Yeah. Right. And the only way to, I guess, confirm what you believe is to hear objections. And like right. if you're able to truly have an answer to those objections and not and not in an emotional way, but in a way that makes sense and everything yeah. else, like, you know, it's going to strengthen your faith right. or your belief. But if you start to have objections that you can't handle and you can't answer, it's like, well, yeah, then. Maybe I need to rethink what, you know, I yeah. believe to be true. And I do that all the time in business. Right. Right. I'm getting data every day and I'm like, man, I thought that marketing campaign was going to freaking crush it. Yeah. And it didn't. Mm -hmm. Now I have to like reevaluate like, was it the marketing campaign? Was it the sales team? Right. Is the product not what people want? Like I'm que I'm always questioning. Yeah. Um, and so it's great when I get to talk to so many people with different perspectives on life. Um, but it, you know, as I, as I like talk to people and everything else, I'm like, okay, but what about this? What about right. that? Like, I want to understand how they defend their viewpoint. That's not even to defend. It's just like, all right, why do you believe that? Yeah. I'm just really curious. Yeah. And have you considered this? Right. And I think that's how we grow as humans. It's not, for sure. you know, people have this problem of like being in an echo chamber. <laughs> yeah. And they want to just only hear what they want to hear. Right. And I think that that's not wise. Uh, yeah, I think it feels safe. You know, it feels... Yeah, it goes back to uh, being familiar right. with what you were doing. Yep. Like we were talking about before. And if it's out of fear, like if you really believe in what you believe, the fear that you have, you're almost not afraid of it because you're so grounded in what you believe. So you can entertain listening to yeah. something else. I'm not going to be you know? tempted or being like, oh, dude, I've lost it all. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I... So... You know, in the spiritual side of things, I yeah. think a lot of it happens with like today, helping people today. But I've, I'm always curious, like, I'm like, so what do you believe happens when we die? Because that is an yeah. inevitable like aspect of life. It's yeah. actually the only inevitable aspect. Yeah. So like, what's your perception on all that? Cool. <laughs> this is the first <laughs> time on a podcast I've been able to talk about this kind of stuff. So this is exciting for me. Yeah. So what do I believe happens at death? So if you were to study that book, I'm, for example, Paramahansa Yogananda, um, when you read that book, there's something about it that you can feel it's genuine, the experiences Paramahansa Yogananda had in India with different enlightened gurus and things like that. Um, he had these profound things happen where, that, that defy our belief about what's even possible. Right. Like, like people that can do literally like magical things that go beyond our reality. Mm -hmm. um, he met Gandhi. He's connected. Like there's the whole book is just his journey of his life. Chapter 43 is my favorite chapter. It's called the resurrection of Sri Yukteswar. I think I'm saying that name right, but basically his mentor was Sri Yukteswar, who is like his enlightened guru, basically that like trained him and like worked with him. Um, his guru dies. And what happens is his guru, after his guru dies, he's super, uh, like, super distraught about it, kind of, like, sad about it. Um, and a couple weeks after his guru dies, he's in meditation, and his guru comes back to him to literally, li literally, like, flesh and blood, not like he's, like, seen him in a vision or he's having a dream and he's there. He was in a meditation, and Sri Yukteswar literally, like, came to him, and he was able to see him, like, kind of like we're speaking now, and he explains to him what happens in the higher dimensions in these higher realities. And he explains what happens. And that's my favorite chapter of the whole entire book, probably one of my favorite, like favorite chapters of any book, which is that chapter because it's so interesting to me, but, and I'll correlate this with a couple other sources as well, just so yeah, yeah. people are like, well, what about this source is not legit or something like that. But basically when we die, we're of a certain 
level of consciousness to where we go to what it could be called an astral planet, an astral plane of existence, which is way more, I guess, divine or enjoyable than here of being encapsulated with the five senses. Now, what may happen is beings of loved ones, so beings from this life or maybe even past lives may be there to witness you and be with you when you pass. You may, in this in this book, chapter 43, it says that sometimes you're more excited to see beings from other past lives that you had versus just this life. But in general, when you die, you have all these beings that are there with you that are excited to see you and to kind of welcome you in. Now you go to, and you, you have like 800 years to spend in these astral planets where you are able to experience basically learning about this last incarnation you have. Uh, you have guides and spiritual guides that help you understand different lessons. It's very divine. You don't need to eat food the way we eat food here in that book in the chapter 43 it mentions these like you may eat if you want but you're you're um fed by the light of the divine like it flows through you you can eat and like eat vegetables and ray like vegetables and it, it says things about that but basically the idea is that um and what it says is that you have these beings of that are around you that you've known from either this life or past life there's lessons that you have you have a period of time where you can take to just enjoy um, basically abilities beyond what you, we have here, where when you think of things, they instantly appear. Um, what is said in Paramahansa Yogananda book is that there are these things called the spheres of Hiraloka. And when you get to a certain level of consciousness where you physically leave your body when you die, you do not die normally using the way that normal, most people die. You physically make the choice to leave your body at death. You enter this one realm where what you're able to do is basically not have to incarnate again. You don't have to incarnate anymore. There's like a big celebration, but it's like this level of consciousness where you go to this astral planet that is equal to that, where it's basically you've graduated in mm -hmm. a way, and then you can decide where you go from there. But it's basically like you go to an astral planet that is equal to the vibration and the level of consciousness when you died, and you're not necessarily allowed in the higher ones because the higher ones aren't of an equal vibration. So it's like the lessons you learn in your life kind of determine where you go, but you have this like kind of grounds for like connecting to other beings, learning lessons. And it's a very divine, like heavenly, very much type experience before you may choose to incarnate again to learn more lessons. And to incarnate is like something that we may actually enjoy doing. We may enjoy having the human experience of forgetting who we are to remember who we are. Now that's, Paramahansa Yogananda's, that's just one chapter in that book that explains that. Um, and by the way, when Paramahansa Yogananda died, he went and gave a speech and he then got into, he, he laid down on a couch very similar to this and left his body. And for a month afterwards, his body did not deteriorate. This is like a documented thing. That, that's how he passed away. He physically left his body by choice. His eyes went up into like a cross where he looked at his third eye and it's like, a, it's a certain yogic Kriya yoga position. Um, and he, he, he like pretty much left his body and his body did not deteriorate for a month, which I found very interesting. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, correlations here. Now, if we look at some other spiritual texts, there's, um, these are more spiritual, I doubt, I, I don't know if your audience has probably seen these before, but um, there's other sources like, um, uh, Seth Speaks is the name of these books that uh, I've heard Oprah talk about and other people talk about, but there are these um, kind of channeled material that kind of, uh, that's also the law of one. The law of one is channeled material, which basically means that it's like kind of channeled from some higher realm in a way. I know it sounds esoteric and it'll probably like, yeah. you know, probably be really weird to a lot of the listeners listening. However, there's a lot of consistency when it comes to kind of what it shares happens after our death, which is something I recently went through. I lost my mom back in uh, December of last year, just a few months ago. Wow. And I went through a whole process where it, in a weird way, I feel more connected to her now than even like when she was alive, her and I were close. But now that she's gone, I feel very connected to her because I feel like in a way I have a spiritual guide that's like helping me in different ways. There's different dreams I have connected to her. Um, but in the book, uh, it, it made me go down this whole realm of of studying death because when someone in your family dies, you want to understand more of maybe what happened. Um, but I found a lot of comfort in a lot of the things that I read about basically kind of like the stream that I'm talking about, whether it's the Paramahansa Yogananda chapter 43, or whether it is that uh, the Seth speaks of talking about what happens after death, which it says basically the same thing. After we die, we have a certain, we have like a life review where we review our life we see the things of how we made other people feel and we see the things where we made certain decisions 
and then we experience it all in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. um, even if you study NDEs, near-death experiences, there are thousands of people that have NDEs that leave their body and then don't want to come back because it's so divine and heavenly. Mm -hmm. And then I think people interpret that based on their belief systems. So some people say, I saw God, I saw Jesus. And God and Jesus are ways of understanding the divine energy that we are. So of course, those are the, or, may, or may angels, you know, that's the belief system they have to see that. Whereas somebody that maybe believes in Muhammad or Allah or whatever, you know, they, they, they would see something different, you know? Um, but in general, when we, when a lot of people have NDEs, they have a life review and they have a life review and they see how they made everyone else feel. And they go through the, they have very, a lot of people come back very transformed from it. Yeah. And then sometimes they don't even want to come back because they're in such a divine state. Mm. Um, but then they do. And sometimes they're told you have more to do. You have more to experience. Um, but in general, yeah, I think when we die, I think we're eternal spiritual beings living temporary human experiences. I believe when we come to earth, we forget who we are and part of the purpose of earth experience is for us to remember who we are, to remember that we're connected to God, the divine, uh, Jesus, whatever the the whatever we resonate with. And the, the whole intention is to connect back to that energy mm -hmm. and to uh, know that we are eternal, that we exist now. Energy can't be created nor destroyed. It always exists. Yeah. So it changes its form. Now, whether it changes its form and we experience, you know, don't you think we'd get bored if we were in heaven and it's just amazing, right? It's freaking awesome being in heaven. Mm -hmm. Do you think eventually we might get bored? Maybe like, I, I hope not. You know, if like, I'm in the best place ever, I hope not. Like think of eternity. Like think of all the time that exists, like just forever. It's mm -hmm. like this long stretch of time. Mm -hmm. It's like, Maybe eventually we're like these divine beings. What if right now we're in the divine, but we're dreaming we're here? Like, what mm. if right now you're connected in heaven? Like we're in heaven right now. Like the matrix. Kind of like the matrix, but we're projecting our consciousness here. And then when we go to bed at night, we kind of like maybe reconnect to more of an ability to connect to these different streams of consciousness. But then we forget it because part of being in this physical ego avatar is that we forget who we are to remember who we are. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, so, just, yeah. I'm kind of riffing yeah, on different you, things you gotta, here. I you think you it's fun. You have a lot of ideas. So- Here's my thing with it is obviously there's lots of um, philosophies on what happens when you die. Right? Yeah. Since the beginning of time, people have been wondering yep. what's next, right? Yeah. So there's been different uh, religions, different people say different things. Um, and then obviously uh, what you just explained is what you believe. Yeah. And so, you know, the question then becomes, for me, I'm a logical guy. I've always been. And yeah. So like me tapping into the spiritual side has been um, new. For me. Yeah. Even though I grew up in the church, I was always more theologically based. And then now I've been really embracing the spiritual side the last couple of years. That's cool. Um, but what I'll say is you always have to, for, for whatever path you end up believing happens next, there's a reason why you believe that path, right? Yeah. And so for me to believe why I believe, right? It's like, all right, I believe what the Bible says about what happens after this, right? I believe. Yeah in all of those different things. Now, there's a lot that we don't know about death, right? And we don't really know how heaven's going to be for yeah. eternity. We don't know how God perceives time and how we perceive time and what it will be like up there. Like, I have no idea. Right. Um, but the reason I believe in what I believe with with Jesus and, and heaven and everything else is because of just the evidence and what Jesus did, what he said, the fruit from what he did, you know, the amount of people killed to get yeah. the message out there, his his followers, his disciples, the way the church has spread, um, how my own life has been impacted from believing, you know, the things I've seen that are supernatural that cannot be explained. Yeah. Uh, you know, essentially my own testimony. Right. right. Because at the end of the day, I could just talk Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible right. verse. Right. But nobody can ever take away what you've experienced yes. and felt. Yeah. Right. So I guess my my question ends up being to anybody is like, okay, you believe, I can't pronounce the guy's name, um, yeah. but basically like his Yogananda. Version, yeah. Well, we won't say the first name, just Yogananda. Yogananda. Yeah. And like, he doesn't have a religion, right? It's just, he's just a guy. Um, or does he have a religion? Like, is that a religion? I don't know. I don't know if he had a religion. Yeah. But either way, you you believe basically what he said. Uh, I, I think that book is one of the most powerful books I've ever read, um, and I'm referencing it in this in this in this podcast. But it's not like I don't live by that book. Like I don't read it every day, and it's it's but more I guess, so. I guess it, it comes down to what what made you believe that. 
that that's what happens. My own experience of just the research that I've done and my own also in uh, discernment of spiritual intuition. Okay. So when I went so through, like I heard that, I actually, so I can yeah, feel So that. like doing it, so when I, in 2012, when I went through my awakening, I had, I became so fascinated um, with learning more about reality, learning more about the spiritual dimension of life because I never had been exposed to it before. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research. I read lots of books. I meditated and went inwards a lot. I was studying just many different forms, but I would see, I'd pick certain things from, I'd use my intuition to see what resonates. And sometimes I would do oh, this part resonates with me. This part doesn't resonate with me. And I would just kind of like go through. So it was kind of a mix of the external of studying different things, but also the internal of connecting to my own like self in meditation, but also intuition of like learning about these different things and piecing them together. I think what I do on my YouTube channel is there's this capacity of like these esoteric concepts and teachings. And what I like to do is bring it down to earth, make it practical and relatable, but also kind of, like simplify it because there are, there is a lot of correlation with certain, certain sources, whether it's the Yogananda book, uh, or it's Seth speaks or it's Jane Roberts or it's, you know, Abraham Hicks or all of these other like, like thought processes or whatever, or the law of one, the raw materials. Yeah. Um, so it's like, uh, basically it's, it's a mixture of both. I'd say it's, yeah. it's intuitional. I've had my own spiritual experiences as well. Yeah, it, it's your research. And then it's you saying, do, do, does this feel correct? Yes. And yeah, and med meditation as well. Not that like I go in meditations, people tell me, you know, someone that appears and tells me the secrets of the universe. <laughs> but when I go into meditation, there is this presence that, that kind of like I'm able to connect to, which I believe everybody has the connection to tap in within themselves. But um, that like energy brings me a lot of just yeah. like under, maybe it tunes me in a certain way to where I can kind of like see what resonates with me at like a deep level, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to know like, you're talking about 2012 was a big moment for you, right? Now yeah. it's been 12 years since. And wow, yeah. you're, 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 you're going to put everything through the filter of all the experiences that have happened since then. Yep. And that's going to basically be what you're calling discernment of, right. Hey, based on everything I've gone through mm. this new thing I'm learning, I think that's accurate based on my own life yeah. experience. Right. And the same thing is true for me, right? As a Christian, I've been a Christian a long time. I just have this worldview that everything gets filtered through. Right. And for right or wrong, I'm like, that doesn't sound right or that sounds right. And, yeah. you know, that's my discernment. And so it's super important for people to really pick what you're going to filter through. Because the problem is, as humans, we, we just, we're not that smart. Right. Like yeah. at the end of the day, we're just really not. And we're always on this constant journey, like you're saying, of self-discovery and learning and growth and everything else. And it's very easy for me to change my opinion tomorrow on something yeah. that I'm like, I get a new piece of information. I get a new experience and I'm like, you know, whatever. And people do this in a very bad way many times when it's like, whatever, they get out of a tough relationship and yeah. they're like, all men are bad. Right. Right. They lose money on a real estate deal. Real estate is a bad investment. Yeah. It's like, no, like yeah. your own life, dis you know, <laughs> right. That's what you think because that's what you've experienced, but it's, it's still not true. Yeah. And so I think what's very important for people to know is regardless of their life experience, there's a decision to make. And that is, do you believe in your own subjective truth because of your experience or is there a greater truth that is absolute truth? And we all have to decide this. Yeah. Because if we only judge things from our own life experience, we're easily deceived. Yeah. And, you know, for me, as I just kind of look at my own research and everything else, my own trying to even take out my own life experience out of it, right? Yeah. Like, okay, let's just back out. Like, let's not, as, as, as best as I humanly can, let's be like, okay, let's say, what if Jesus wasn't the way? Let's like look at all of this objectively, Okay. What do they believe? What do they believe? Because that's the first step, right? Right. Because I know if I go try and create my own religion, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. I'm just a cult leader and I don't, right. where am I even getting my information from? Yeah. Right. So if I'm going to look at all the major religions and, and, and ways, I'll be like, all right, these are what they all believe. What's the evidence? Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, the people that follow this, what, what does their lives look like? Right. Right. And 
you know, how long has this been around? Like all these things. And so like, when I look at like the logical evidence for the Bible, I'm like, oh, well, there literally is nothing that has anything close to the archaeological evidence that the Bible has, Mm -hmm. right? Like we use the Iliad as an example of like this historical book. There's like five copies, you know, from thousands of years ago. There's 5,000 copies of the Bible, you know, um, with the Quran. There's like 500 copies that were hundreds of years after. Yeah. You know, like you have so much more archaeological evidence for the Bible than any other book in history. Mm. So I'm like, okay, that's plus one for Christianity. Yep. Nobody can debate it. It's just a fact in terms of, you know, objectional evidence. And then so you start saying, okay, there's more history on this than anything. Okay, what's next? All right, what what are these guys saying? What? How did this even come about? Yeah. Right? And you start looking at the prophecies of Jesus and what Jesus came and fulfilled later on down the road. Like he he hit all these prophecies from the Jews who didn't even like him. <laughs> you mm. know, they're predicting this Messiah. He comes in, he does all these things. And then you get, you know, just evidence from not even just the Bible, but other historians at the time, like Josephus and everything else. And they're like, no, there was this guy, Jesus, like the day there, there was a day that went completely dark. People could not explain it. And, mm. you know, the Bible talks about that when he died, like the day just went completely dark. It was like this crazy day in history. So the, what do they say when it went dark? It is like blackness outside. Yeah. Like when Jesus died, like there was earthquakes, the world went dark, like it was crazy. But what if, what if, so I'm just, I'm just poking around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if that was a metaphor? What if like, but it, it was d- a historical thing, not just in the Bible, but others. Okay, so they so they were saying like there's it's co- not just corrob- a metaphor. No, there's corroborative sources that the world there went was dark. an earthquake. Yes, this day oh, wow. crazy things happened. Yeah, we don't know why. Yeah, the Bible tells you why, but other historical sources you can just go look back and it's yeah. like we don't know what happened, but it was all happening at this mm. time. Bible has an explanation, right? And then you just kind of look at the disciples and you're like, man, these guys followed Jesus for years. They all turned on him when he died. Wow, because they're like. Oh, well, dude, our leader's gone. And then, you know, he comes back three days later and then all of a sudden they're rejuvenated. They're like, dude. (laughs) Thanks for coming back, bro. Yeah, well, it's just like, (laughs) I'm sorry we doubted you even though you did all these miracles before, but like, okay, this is for real. Now you're really the way. Yeah. Okay, we're all in now. (laughs) And so like, that's what happened. Peter denied him. And then you just look at it and every single disciple, except for John, was murdered and killed and persecuted. Yeah spreading the message. They didn't, yeah. they had literally nothing to gain. They were poor, they had poverty, they had no gain by doing this. Mm. And they all died never renouncing what they saw or what they believed. Yeah. And then you just look at like the for me anyways, like this is all as a logical guy like looking at objectional evidence and I'm like, "Man, dude, all of a sudden this church grows to what it grows through. Um you have literally date the, the way we count time was split." Yeah. From this guy's death and his birth. Uh, yeah. You just, so for me, like objectionally looking at evidence, I'm like, okay, there's more evidence for this than anything else. Yeah. So I should really take a hard look at this thing before everything else. Right. Right. And that's just one way to go about it. Yeah. When you're searching for truth, because like, if I'm going to go try and learn how to flip a house or what's the best investment vehicle, I'm going to start researching and looking for evidence. And I'm yeah. like, how many people actually get rich from real estate? Like, Who's actually done it? Right. And you're going to just start doing, how many people actually become YouTubers? Can you make money? Can you have success? And you're going to like do your evidence and you do it and you're like, okay, I believe it's, it's a legitimate thing. God's a legitimate, you know, being. Right. Okay. So who should I go with? Yeah. (laughs) Is Aaron going to teach me? Like what's Aaron done? Right. So they're going to look at your evidence and your fruit. What's this guy done? What's that guy done? Right. Now, it's a different metaphor, but the point remains the same, like, on how people should seek truth. Right. Like, I don't, there's nothing, by the way, just so everyone knows, there's nothing wrong with believing something because you've grown up that way, you have your testimony, you've just felt it, you see right. it, and look, like, nobody can ever take that away from you. Yeah. But once you start, like, thinking from a business perspective and everything else, like, and if you wanted to truly look at it from the debate perspective of, like, what we were talking about earlier yeah okay well let's take let's take everything out the window and objectionally look at all these different ways and decide which way has the i I don't know the highest likelihood yeah of being true yeah i don't know that's kind of how i see things a lot of times yeah 
I think we all have those filters. Yeah. For how we see things. And how, I'm still super biased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But only because of the filters I've created right. throughout my life. Yeah. I think a lot of times we also, we create safety through those filters, yeah. right? Because then you know, there's like more of a predictable predictable feeling of safety that comes from that. Yeah. So we all do it our own way, you know? Do you ever hear about um, that? It was like some cult that they all killed themselves like 40 years ago or something. The Manson people or something? I think something like that, right? I've heard of something like that. Yeah. yeah. Like this guy was like certain, I think Jesus was coming back like yeah. at this date. And so he's like, yeah, you know, God told me we had to all kill ourselves before. So they drank Kool-Aid or something? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so they did that. But like even during that thing, like they've done documentaries now and it was weird because like it wasn't happening right yet yeah and like they had said this is going to happen this is going to happen it didn't happen and yet people still kept drinking it they were like why are people still doing it like yeah that makes no sense yeah and the reality was it was going to be harder for them to go live life without that filter right because they had just told everyone they burned their bridges they were just like all in on this and it was it was clearly not true right and so the embarrassment the Everything was more painful than, you know, it's just like, you know what? And also too, just everyone else is doing it. Yeah. Let's do it. And so like, I think there is that element and it goes back to the same thing we talked about with like women's shoes. Right. It's like, ah, you know what? I know that this might not be the way, but dude, I don't know. My life's fine. Yeah. The way it is. I don't really want to go through the headache. Right. And the unknown. Yep. Of, of this other way. Yeah. 100%. People are creatures of uh, habit. Of habit, familiar energy. You know, it's interesting. The word familiar is very similar to the word familial, mm. you know? So I think, and sometimes I think as kids, we, we grow up kind of having a certain authority figure, you know, whether it's parents and whatnot. But based on the dynamic that we have with the parents, sometimes we may recreate similar familiar dynamics later on yeah. in life. So for example, someone may have someone that was very controlling, a controlling parent, maybe, And then later on, they're like, I always attract controlling boyfriends or girlfriends, you know, or husband, wife, whatever. Like there's, there's this controlling aspect for me. I was working that nine to five job and I had a controlling manager that was very reflective of control that was in my life when I was like seven to six, 16 years old. Yeah. So it was familiar. It was familiar. Why do I keep attracting this? It's familiar. You know, what are your views on money as a spiritual guy? I believe money is a neutral concept that has no built-in meaning other than the meaning we give it. So we use money as a collective agreement within our reality to express value. So money is a neutral thing. So you see some spiritual people like money is bad, it's yeah, controlled yeah. by the government, I it's not backed by gold. Yeah. So that perspective though, well, if you have that perspective about money, if you imagine money is a person and you're like, you're bad. I don't like you. Like, are they going to want to hang around you? You know, yeah. now at the same time, if you're like, you're amazing, you're the best thing ever. If you were around someone that was like, oh my God, Ryan, you're the best thing ever. I just, you, you'd yeah. also, I'd be like, Hey dude, like, exactly. Relax. Yeah. So it's a good position to have with money is to kind of see it neutral, to see it for what it is. It's a neutral tool that we use that displays and is an exchange of value. So the way that I view money is if I want to acquire money, which money is a neutral thing, money is energy, then what I want to do is I want to focus on what I want to give. And a lot of people don't focus on what they want to give. They focus on getting, right? They want to manifest the car. I want the car. I want the money. I want this. I want to get, 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 get. But that's only half the equation. You have to give. You have to give. And you give based on the, the, it could be, the ener- the uh, the mission God gave you the the purpose that you have the alignment that you feel to the divine to God to source you doing that normally will add value to other people so focus instead on the value that you can give to other people that may be the switch to allowing the money into your life because money is just energy yeah so how do you put out that energy that then gets back the exchange of that like if you watch Shark Tank you yeah. know the, the the way they look at a product is how much value can it add. And based on that, on it, does it solve a problem and does it add value? That's when the sharks will invest in that, you know? So it's, it's all about value. It's about, an, or at least perceived value. I know you can look at like the scrub daddy and you'd be like, yeah, but it adds perceived value in the marketplace somehow. Otherwise it wouldn't be doing so well, you know? Yeah. But in the same way, that's, that's how, that's kind of how I see money. So money to me is in the beginning, there was a lot of guilt. 
um, where when I went through my awakening, I was like, screw the government. It's all a control <laughs> faction. And of course I wasn't attracting any money or abundance. Yeah. But then eventually I realized that I kind of had this epiphany, this realization that it's just this neutral, everything in life is a reflection of what we believe to be true. So if I believe money is bad, I'm not going to attract it. And I think spirituality in general, we, I, I believe we came here to enjoy this humanly experience, as well as the spiritual dimension. We like to say, this is spiritual. That crystal over there is spiritual. <laughs> that the Bible is spiritual. This is spiritual. And discount that everything is also connected to that spiritual dimension that we live in. Like it could be very spiritual experience yeah. for you to walk your dog, to connect with your kids. Like that could be a very spiritual experience, but it's like, we don't label it. It doesn't involve- S a Side note. Why do people think crystals are spiritual? Like, I it's don't just, even, I've never understood that. Crystals come, like, from what I understand, I'm not a crystal es expert. I do have a lot of crystals in my house. I love crystals. <laughs> oh, okay. But I don't, I don't like, I'm not like using crystals, like manifesting. You're not with, worshiping the crystals. I'm not worshiping crystals. I think crystals are a reflection of consciousness in the sense that when you look at like the geometrical form of crystals and how they're all connected using sacred geometry, there's a certain connection that it, like a crystal has between it and all of its parts. And yeah. it's reflective in many ways. So in like crystal skulls, for example, which were big back in the day, these idea of these crystal, crystalline skulls were like this. I just thought about the crystal ball. I didn't even put two and two together that a crystal ball is these crystals too. <laughs> yeah, a crystal ball is crystal, a crystal yeah. with a point is a crystal. Yeah. But I think it's, I think like everything in life, it's a reflection of our consciousness. So I think crystals reflect back a certain level of our consciousness and it's connection to all of its parts and it's reflective in that way. So mm. um, people yeah. may put in, I think that in general, many things in our reality are what are called permission slips. Got it. So if you believe in crystals and you believe it's amplifying your energy and it works for you, then use it. If it's you self fulfilling, it's a self. It, it could be a self fulfilling yeah. prophecy. Maybe if you study the science of it, there is some geometric form thing that it does. Yeah. But the most important thing is the placebo. I mean, the placebo effect. Yes. Is so powerful that if it works for you, it works Plac for you. Placebo is a real thing. Right. Yeah. So yeah, for crystals, I, I don't. I, I'm very like when people you say, like them, but you're not like I'm you, not attached you don't see to them. A voodoo. Like it, it's the same thing with astrology, whether it's Vedic astrology, traditional astro astrology. I think it's fascinating, but I don't think that it has power over us in the mm. same way that crystals. I don't think has a power over you or Mercury retrograde. This is like a big thing in the spiritual community, which maybe it is a, 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 a scientifically and astrological alignment that exists. However, I like to I like to always bring the power back to ourselves of understanding our belief in it. And if you tell yourself this thing is happening, this astrological alignment is happening, uh, communication is going to be horrible. Like so it, it, it could be a self it's placebo. It's not that it, it is a placebo. Maybe there's some truth. It's a mixture of both. I think, yeah. I think maybe there are, you know, we know the planets affect us in a certain way where gravitationally and, you know, like the, there's a certain correlation we have with the connection. And what if planets are in some way connected to some divine mind or something like that to where there's a certain life path we have and it helps keep us on track for certain things. Um, but I don't think it has power over us, basically. Mm. Got it. Um, but I think I think it's fascinating. Same way crystals are cool. You know what I mean? It's like it's what are the other things like spiritual people? I don't know. I don't want to say worship, but like that like that they get like get caught up in. Yeah, because I've I've heard about crystals. I've heard yeah, about astrology, astrology for sure. Yeah, um, they can get like just super almost like a human design is another one of them. It's kind of like what is that? It's kind of like similar. It's it's connected to gene keys. It's a whole no other, yeah, is. these are all different kind of like um, ways of studying consciousness and of studying like ourselves, kind of like studying this, thyself in some some aspects to understand yourself more, mm -hmm. but they're like different ways that you think and feel similar to astrology. They're, it's connected to astrology in a certain way. Got it. Uh, but those, it's a big thing in like the spirituality niche that I'm in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I will say that, like for me, I've had some powerful experiences, even with Vedic astrology, for example, mm. where there's this YouTuber who um, she's a she's been a Vedic astrologer for like 10 years. She was a traditional astrologer for 20 years. And I went on her YouTube channel and she like read my chart to public in public. And she was able to look back at my past and say, what, you know, when you were five years old, this happened. When you were 12 years old, this happened. When this ha what happened in 2002, like she was able to see these big milestones in my life. I was like, oh, when I was five, my parents divorced. When I was 11, this happened. When I was 16, this happened. Like it is, does get a little trippy sometimes when, when there's so such a level of detail to certain things that are clearly shown. Yeah in a certain modality. Yeah. But once again, I don't think it's like either you believe either you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus or astrology. 
What if these are all just divine tools that we can tap into if we want, but not once again, give them the power, say this has power over me and this is the end all be all. Yeah. What if these are just powerful tools, you know? And that's, that's kind of how I see it. I'm, I'm interested in all of this. I'm interested yeah. in exploring it. And it, through experience of having a reading, for example, of, from someone in Vedic astrology has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. Param Paramahansa Yogananda or y Yogananda. Yeah, yeah. His uh, guru was a Vedic astrologer mm. and it's, it's fascinating to me. You, you know, know what, what I mean? So I'll give you my uh, point of view as a Christian. I actually agree with what you're saying and people would find that weird. The reason I agree is because the Bible actually talks about sorcery yeah. and mediums and these kinds of like, let's just say weird things, yep. right? And witchcraft even. Right. And you start to look at that and you're like, okay, that's weird that the Bible's talking about that. But the Bible wouldn't, talk about something that wasn't real. Right. So clearly people were doing these things and they were like getting real results. Like yeah. things were happening. Right. So whenever I hear people like, oh, dude, the psychic's a fraud or this, and that, I'm like, no, there's, there's actually a very real possibility that they do have in your words, defined power. Now uh, here's, yeah. here's the only difference though, is in the Christian world. And what I believe too, is that I do believe there are two types of power. Yeah. You know, there's demonic power and then there's godly power. Right. Right. And I think when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you do have godly power. You're able to do miraculous things. Yeah. There's no way you could do them. I do believe people still get healed today. I yeah. do believe that people can still speak prophecy and other things. The yeah. Bible says those things. Right. And then on the other side of the coin, I do believe there's still demonic things happening yep. where people have supernatural power to do things but they're not godly things. I agree. Yeah. I think there's I think there's many flavors of certain energies or certain modalities even. So there can be a divine way of using um some form of, you know, there could be witchcraft or some form of voodoo things that's yeah, yeah. used negatively to impact people, but there could also be a similar esoteric type modality that promotes healing. Yeah. And and connection to holy water or something like what that. What do you think about like those Ouija boards and stuff? I You're never, like, whatever. <laughs> I've never, yeah, I've never used one. I think, I think that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we have connection to like the mystical sides of life, just meditating. Um, if we want to like get friends and we all hold this thing and we, we go around in this, this like certain direction to like, it's a, it's a permission slip. <laughs> yeah. If somebody believes in it, then cool. But what is the intention? Is someone trying to summon the ghost of some demon that's going to like do magic for them? Or yeah. are they trying to connect to maybe like, a past ancestor that died like it can be used maybe either way but it ultimately depend because i believe beliefs create reality that person's belief system and their intentions will determine what aspects of that they get what they see or yeah. what they see what they experience so intention is a an intention is very important to be very clear on of having what i consider to be divine intention mm. a tenention an intention that's connected to a higher power or a higher calling then when it's most pure it's almost like you get more of a beneficial reflection in your life of those things. You have to, in a way, I believe that, especially as like people that are doing the kind of work that I do, the kind of work that you do of having a following and being leaders in, in that way, yeah. it's very important to use this power for good and to not overly identify with the ego, but to really do it for good, for... um for like helping people and, 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 yeah. and there are people though that can have a following that can use it to manipulate people. They can use it for their own selfish benefits. But I believe that the energy that we're moving into as time goes on is almost like there's less wiggle room to stay in that. It's almost like you get slapped on the, on the hand much sooner, yeah. you know? So it's very important to stay with that connection to the divine, to God, to, to what we believe in yeah. that, that allows us to stay in that alignment. Yeah. You know, I had a, you mentioned earlier, you were like, yeah, you know, I was on Ritalin and doing weed and all this stuff. And you're like, I don't do any of that anymore. Yeah. A lot of spiritual people I see do a lot of drugs. Yeah. Like, what's up with that? Well, I think, mm, I think there could be a couple of things there. I think there like are a they, lot of, they, a lot of people I hear, they're like, Hey, I get higher consciousness when I'm on this drug. Yeah. What this experience. I think that there is a connection. I think there could be a couple of things. I think on one hand, our beliefs the beliefs, the filters we have are what are reflected back to us. So on one hand, if there's a belief there that a lot of spiritual people are kind of this woo-woo, ungrounded, spiritual hippie person that maybe you, through that synchronicity, meet more of those types of people, um, that could be one on one hand. On the second hand, 
I think that it's, there's this exploration of psychedelics that's happening yeah. where people are very interested in things that expand consciousness. So they, they studied things like mushrooms and plant medicines like ayahuasca and yeah. things like that. And that that's a way for them to like explore their own consciousness in some ways. However, I think that it's absolutely 100% not necessary at all. It is not necessary to do plant medicine. It is not necessary to do mushrooms. It's not necessary. If someone feels called to it and that's what they feel like exploring, um, then, you know, have at it, but I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I think, uh, yeah, I think there, there are a certain subset of people that are spiritual that are like all about plant medicine and kind of like this woo woo energy, <laughs> yeah. but there are also a lot, I know a lot of people that don't do anything yeah. and they meditate or they don't even meditate. They're just in a lot, they just have their spiritual, um, beliefs that they have and they live in alignment and they, they love what they do. You know, they live passionately. So I think it's a, a mix of all of those, but, um, yeah. I think yeah. also too, just when I think about it, I'm all, like I said, I'm a logical guy, Yeah. but I'm just like, dude, if you're like so spiritually enlightened, why do you need drugs in it? Like, yeah, it kind of doesn't. And it also, also part of it too, is like looking at, you know, the, the, those people, I would imagine they would say that drugs, there's this big connotation around drugs in general, where you think of like cocaine and you think of like certain things they don't that think are they're drugs, but yeah, they don't think they're drugs. They think that some of them are these ways of remembering certain levels of consciousness, Got something it. like ayahuasca or San Pedro, which is like a cactus, which is made of mescaline, which has a mescaline energy inside of it. Mescalina is the name of the, the energy inside Sounds of like it or, or mushroom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like mezcal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these, uh, in, but once again, I see there is a pattern where sometimes people do it and then they do it and then they do it and then they do it and then they, they really enjoy it and then they keep doing it and it becomes this, this, they're just hooked. They're, they're, they come to this this hook, but if you truly do something like ayahuasca, it can be a very uh, it can be a very intense experience where you are purging and letting go of childhood trauma, and it's it's maybe not the most enjoyable, but there's so much fruit that comes on the other side of that, where you got what you needed and you're done for your life for life, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think it, there's there's a mid range of everything, just like I'm sure there's a mid range of Christianity, the people that are overly obsessed with the, you know, Bible script verses or whatever else maybe that, you know, yeah. the focus can be, it can be done overly and abused. It can be done in a healthy manner that is really genuine for someone to explore. Someone may pick the tool up for a while and then let it go and then be done with it for their whole life. Yeah. I've seen people do ayahuasca once or twice. They, they powerful experience. They're done. They don't ever feel called to it again. And that's, that's cool, you know, but then there are people that just do it, they do it, they do it, they do it because it's, um, maybe I don't know if it's an escape. I don't know what it is, you know? Yeah. Last question I'll leave you with. So knowing all that and everything we've talked about, what do you think um, the purpose of life is? It's to live in love. I mean, it's to, it's to, I believe life is a form of school that we come to, to learn who we are. I believe the purpose of life is to know, know thyself, mm -hmm. to know who you are, to know your connection to God, the spirit, the, the divine, whatever label yeah. we want to give it. Um, I believe we come here to remember who we are and then to embody that in whatever way that we can in our most expressive way. And that as we go through life, that may change, not change in the way of like, what are we passionate about? I think living our purpose is very important. Following our excitement as much as we can. That feeling of excitement, I believe, is like almost our soul's signature saying, do more of this. This is who you really are. And when we learn the lessons we kind of evolve. I mean, ultimately, I think it's to elevate our vibration. It's to elevate our level of consciousness. Got it. Another word for that, though, is to, to love ourselves, to love each other, mm. you know? So it's kind of like, I think those two, those things are interconnected as well. Yeah. Now, I, I thought as as you were speaking, I was like, I'm pretty sure he's going to say to remember ourselves. Yeah. Because that's, you've and talked then about I said that it. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember ourselves. And to, yeah, yeah, yeah. because the funny thing about enlightenment and all of these things it's like we are naturally already that thing. It's yeah. so we believe we're not and we're trying to fight for it. We're trying to. Yeah, I had, so, a guy, I had another guy's name, Sebastian Ingus, and um, he's the only other person I heard mention that phrase. Remember that? Remember? Yeah. He, yeah. And, you know, his 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 belief system is very interesting because he's like, yeah, you know, I'm Christian. And then he, you know, you'd be a hybrid of you and me. I see. And yeah. he's like, yeah, you know, but I think we're just on here on earth to remember ourselves and everything. I'm like, yeah, well, huh? Where? <laughs> like, what if, what if we're still asleep in the higher realms, projecting our consciousness yeah. here? We're these divine spiritual beings that have forgotten it. We're living in these ego avatar bodies that feel separate from everyone else. But the goal is to get more in we're, alignment. We're, we're like avatar. 
in the movie. Kind of. It could could be. Yeah, I think these <laughs> I think certain movies have a certain impact on the collective consciousness because at a deep level, maybe somehow it it like it resonates with us. You know what I mean? Yeah. At like a deeper core, you know? Yeah. If anyone was to ask me, um, I go back to what I said earlier as well of like, you know, Jesus tells us pretty simple. Just love God, love others. Yeah. And uh, you do those two things, you're you're doing life the right way. And it's like, yeah, it's vague, but when you just think about it, you're like, okay, if I love God, then I'm going to do things that are honoring to God. I'm yeah. going to be obedient to what I feel like God's calling me to do. I'm going to live my life for him and not for me. Yep. Right. And then you go to love others and it's like, okay, how do I love others? I got to serve. Them. Right. I got to treat them right. I got to yeah. be good. And Jesus didn't say, you know, love God, love others and love yourself. Right. It was just two. Yeah. And I think people get that misconception where they're like, man, I got to, you know, I got to love me and I got to do me. And it's like, Honestly, the way you become better is by thinking of yourself less. And yeah, helping. isn't that funny? Yeah. Becoming selfless, yeah, makes you become more like like soulful. You have more self worth. Like yeah, when you are less focused on you. Yeah, it's funny. Like doing live events and stuff. Like when you get on stage, if it's all about you, how am I looking? It's yeah. like a different energy. But if you're like, no, this, how can I add value to these people? Exactly. It brings out like this this energy that's like indescribable. And, and, and your own self you know, things that you need to happen for you will happen. They'll happen. Right. You know, like you'll yeah. get the results, you'll get the sales, you'll get the, ex like all of it comes into tune. If you just worry about everyone else. And, and, and funny enough though, if you look at this from a deeper perspective, if everyone is another aspect of you, technically doing things for other people is also selfish, <laughs> right? Cause you're also doing it for yourself. You're, right. It's all you anyways. But I think what we you have to be mindful of is the, the you that is the ego you. There could be like a higher self aspect that's connected to the divine. And then the ego that's separate and wants to be right. Yeah. That's the part that can't exist in the kingdom of heaven because it's so separate. It's, it's a small you that's like egotistical and angry and jealous and all of these things. But when you transcend that and realize that's not who you really are, that's like the conditioned pattern self. We would call that sin. Yeah. Well, you know, it's sin, potato, potato, <laughs> yeah. sin, corrupting what, you know, God made us in right. a perfect way. And yeah, sin on this earth has corrupted us. And right. Once we get into heaven, we don't have to deal with that anymore. It's like sin's kind of programmed, you know? It's like a program that like people... Yeah, it, it adds these other elements of greed and selfishness yeah. and lust and, you know, depression and yep. all these negative things. So, yeah, it's just interesting, you know, as I talk to people, it's like, you know, we agree on um, the problems of the world. Right. We agree on what's actually happening. And then, you know, really it's like, okay, but how do you fix it? Yeah. That ends up being the big yeah. question to answer, right? Because it's like, all right, well, I think you can fix it through doing these, these five things. Right. And you know, some on the, the crazy spiritual side be like, okay, so you need to go on a retreat and, a, right. and a whatever. Right. Others be like, no, it's like, let's meditate. You can fix yourself and, yeah. you know, do this and that. And then, you know, on the Christian side, I might say, well, you got to give your life to Jesus and that's it. Like at the end of the day, once you do that, you're going to get the Holy spirit and the rest just fixes itself. Yeah. Because you're already transformed from the inside and then your yep. external will shift. Right. You know, and we all agree that you got to shift your own internal first. Yes. Before you can actually, yeah. it's that identity shift. Right. We've been talking about. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's always interesting to hear the different ways of, um, achieving, I guess, peacefulness and joy and love on this earth. Yeah. And then just goes to, all right, what happens after? Yeah. Right? Was the decision I made what happens after? Because, you know, you can live a, a good life here, but, you know, what's what next? What, what's next is the bigger yeah. question. I think one of the other things I'll say to that as well is one thing that's always fascinated me mm -hmm. is so similar to probably your terminology be for it, praying. Yep. Praying. Um, doing guided group meditation where we all have a unified intention to either connect to our hearts or connect to the divine. I've done these meditations on my YouTube channel. For example, we had t during COVID when this happened, I had 12,000 people on my channel at one moment and there were people all over the world doing this guided mass meditation. There's something called the Schumann resonance, which is the frequency of the planet. And it fluctuates depending on the sun and depending on the people on the planet and its energy. Right. And what happens is when we do these live guided meditations, it goes off the charts. And there's something called the Maharishi effect. The Maharishi effect is when 5,000 transcendental meditators get together and they focus on peace and love in the world. It can decrease violent crimes 
by a substantial percentage, like 70% of violent crimes will go down for days afterwards mm. from these transcendental meditators meditating on peace and love. So doing these guided meditations with now even like, you know, not that they're not specifically transcendental meditators, the people that come that join my YouTube channel or join my live events and stuff. But when we do these live meditations, they're so powerful. The people that join them feel there's just, there's something that happens energetically when they join because there's a mass thought form, which I know is an esoteric concept, but of, of thousands or tens of thousands of people meditating at the same moment on the same intention, there's this energy stream that happens that I believe opens up so much more. It like opens up the divine. It allows people to like create very powerful transformation from that energetic state that also has a powerful effect on the world. And I think a lot of times the way certain things maybe are set up right now of control in the world where I know it sounds conspiracy theory, but like there's a lot of the news is 90% negative. A lot of things yeah. are around separating us and making yes. us feel in fear. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree to that. Like yep. when you look outside, everything is fearful, dispersing energy and keeping people feeling separate and powerless. When you keep people in fear and anger, they're much easier to control. On the counter side of that, what I like to do and the thing that I'm really passionate about is getting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people together to meditate at the same moment in a guided meditation experience for 15, 20 minutes to allow the divine energy to flow through God, source energy, whatever label we want to give it to flow through us that then flows into our reality. Mm -hmm. And I believe one of the ways we can literally create heaven on earth is by us teaming up energetically together with a unified intention of wanting to love each other, of wanting to bring that love into our reality. And it's like science is showing it more and more, this effect on the Schumann resonance and the frequency of the planet. But I'm so fascinated by it because it is such a viscerally powerful experience to have. And it's not me. It's, I might be leading the meditations, but it's it's the 10,000 people or the 20,000 people that get together to do this live meditation together. Mm. And it's it's our energy, you know? So it's yeah. very interesting. But I think to create peace and love in the world, it will requ require us coming together. Whether it is in the future of that, I believe is Christians coming together with Buddhists, coming together with Muslims, coming together with Jewish people. It's gonna be all of us coming together to recognize the humanity in all of us and to recognize that at our core, we just wanna be loved and understood. I think that's the future of where we will eventually, we can eventually head if we all came together, you know? So Yeah, and I would say as much as we're divided right now, the news and everything yeah. else, I would say that that's already been happening. Right. right. Even if yeah. I don't um, agree theologically with a Muslim or a Buddhist, like, right. It doesn't change that. I don't love them. You know, like, yeah, you know, I'll still hang out with them. I'll have them on the podcast. I've, I have them speak at my events. Right. Like, you know, it's all good. Right? Yeah. And this is very different than 500 years ago. For sure. When like, you get killed, if you think something, <laughs> oh, different, yeah, you're you know, getting killed and everything. For yep. all this. So like, I do think that's happening. It's just, yeah. I think TV would have you believe. I agree with that. Yeah. That it's a bigger problem than it is. Yes. Yeah. And, but it keeps people feeling separate or yeah. scary. The world is scary versus realize we have so much more in common. We have way more abundance today than we ever have. Than we, than we ever have. And I think it'll just keep growing. But I think coming together with unified intention and seeing the world differently, being the change we wish to see in the world, that's going to have the biggest impact as to what we can actually do to like change our world. It's not to change and go out and, and to change other people's perspective. It's to change ourselves knowing that reality is just a reflection of ourselves anyways, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, bro, I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you so much for having me on, man. This has yeah, been a lot dude. of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Um, we'll definitely link to your YouTube channel and everything down below. If you Thank guys want to um, get together with Aaron, he's got different things going on. You know, we'll link to those and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. All right. Peace. 99% of the pastors I've talked to are full of shit anyway. If someone doesn't have the self-awareness to understand they don't know either, then dude, it's hard to listen to them. I believe the Bible is 100% authentic and real, and that is the only source of truth.